Question one from paper two then. So straight away you look at that and you think, great, it's ten marks and it's two lines and a point of intersection. Just what you want. <coughs> so here it says the dotted line I've got it in red is the perpendicular bisector of BC. It cuts it in the middle, bisect, cut into two parts. Perpendicular meets a right angle. Right, I find the equation for four marks. Right, well straight away that's going to be <coughs> y minus b equals mx minus a. So I need a point on it, I need its gradient. Well for the point, we have to find that midpoint. I'll we'll give it a name, we'll call it m. So m is the midpoint of bc. <coughs> it's handy having these written up here, because I can just pair them all off as necessary. The midpoint, the average of the x coordinates. So it'll be negative 3 plus 5 up and 2. The average of the y coordinates, negative 1 and negative 5 up and 2. Which means that m is going to be the point that comes to 2, 1, negative 3. So that's the first bit. The point on the line is the point 1, negative 3. Next, the gradient. We'll compare it with BC. <coughs> gradient of BC. Difference in the Y coordinates over the difference in X coordinates between B and C. So it'll be the difference in the Y coordinates. Negative 5. Take away negative 1. That'll be plus 1. 5. Take away negative 3. That'll be plus 3. So that means I've got negative 4 upon 8, which is negative a half. Which means that the perpendicular gradient to that will be the product, <coughs> will be the one that gives a product negative 1. So the perpendicular gradient will be 2. And then it's just a case of feed that in then. So to get the equation of the line, y minus b is mx minus a. Putting in the point m, so you've got y plus 3. <coughs> is 2 times x minus 1. So write this one in the form of y equals, a very handy form. You know what the gradient is, you know where it cuts the axis, and you can use it in substitutions. Use this whenever there's no any, not any fractions. So 2x minus 2 minus 3 minus 5. And I'm going to use that later, so I'll call that number 1. So that was the first bit done, but it's taken up all that space, so clear it. So the second bit says, find the coordinates of the intersection, blah, the perpendicular bisector got it, the median from C. So that's the line that goes from C to the middle of the opposite side, so I'm looking for this line here. The line that cuts it in the middle, but not necessarily at right angles. What well, cuts it in the middle means, I'll get its coordinates, so same as before, N. N's going to be the median, the middle of AB. So, average of the x coordinates, 7 and a negative 3 up and 2, average of the y coordinates, 9 and a minus 1 up and 2, meaning that n is going to be the point 4 up and 2 is 2, 4. So n is the point 2, 4. That's the point on the line. Gradient, I can't compare it to AB, but I can get the gradient of CN. So, gradient of CN, the difference in the y coordinates over the difference in the x coordinates. <coughs> Just a little bit more careful when you subtract them. It's C <coughs> N. So it's this this pair here, C and N. So I've got negative 5, take away 4 for the Y's, and 5, take away 2 for the X's. So I've got negative 9 upon 3, which is negative 3. Which means that the equation of that line is going to be, I'll put it over here, Y minus B is MX minus A using either of the points, I'll just use the point C, so y plus 5 is negative 3 times x minus 5, so y is going to be negative 3x plus 15 minus 5 plus 10, call that equation 2. And then to find the point of intersection, which there's no name, I'll just call that the point P. So to get the point P, I don't know if I can squeeze it all in here, then I'm going to substitute 1, the equation I had before, into 2. So I'll say that. Substitute 1 in 2. Which means that I'm going to have equation 1 was y equals 2x minus 5. So I'm going to substitute that into 2. So that that's going to equal negative 3x plus 10. Away. Bring that over, 5x. Bring that over, 15x equals 3. That's the first part. And then put that back in, substitute x equals 3 in whichever might be more convenient. 
the number one looks an easier one to work with. So that's going to be two. Ooh. Y is going to be two times three taken by five, six taken by five, one. Which means the point of intersection is going to be the point three, one. A nice easy ten marks to start with. Number two then. <coughs> Another one, there it is, size of the angle between two vectors, nine marks. Another one you like to see, standard. Now what does it say here? There's a cuboid, it gives you this faraway point is eight, four, six. That's handy, because that gives you the length, the breadth and the height. You may as well put them in straight away. Length, eight, breadth, four, height, six. That'll take me to any point on it. Eh, what else does it say here? P divides that in the ratio of two to one, so it's two thirds of the way up, and Q is the midpoint, so that's halfway up. And the first bit is, what's the coordinates of P and Q? So A, P, to get to P, along eight for the X direction, don't go back across the Y direction at all, so it's eight, zero. And then it's two thirds of the way up, well that's six, so it'll be two thirds of six, that'll be four. So P is the point, eight, zero, four. Q. Don't go along the X direction at all. Go back four and then halfway up, half of six, three. So that was don't go along, go all the way back four and then only halfway up three. So Q's the point, zero, four, three. And that was the first mark. No, two marks. Next, B. Write down the components of PQ. Well, that'll just be Q minus P. So that'll be. Q, which is 0, 4, 3, minus P, which is 8, 0, 4. So that's going to be negative 8, 4, negative 1. Write down the components of PA. I'm going to fit in here. PA is going to be A minus P. I'm going to give you A, but A is just going to be <coughs> 8, 0, 0. So 8, 0, 0, take away 8, 0, oh, 4. It's just going to be 0, 0, negative 4. Two marks again. Oh, it's raining marks. What's the last part? Find the size of the angle QPA. Now, they won't have thrown you a wobbly here, but if you're asked to find the size of any particular angle, if it says QPA, you want that angle, then you want to get <coughs> the vectors that are radiating away from that. That would be PQ, which is asked you for, and PA, P being the vertex of the angle. So that is exactly what you want. And then you can state straight away, I've not got room to do here, I'll start it off, that the way that that would work would be PQ times PA times the cosine of that angle, I'll just state it the way it is, would be equal to PQ dot PA. Just writing it that way round rather than the other for the two variants of the scalar product. This being the component variant, this being the length times the length times the cosine angle in between. Which means that the cosine of the angle that I want will be PQ dot PA over the length of PQ times the length of PA. Which you could have just started off by stating. Now, you may wish to do these in three separate parts. Work out the scalar product, work out the length, work out the length, but there's plenty of space once I've cleared the board just to put it all in one go. So clear it. There it is, back up the top. So just put in the bits and pieces. Scalar product. Working out the scalar product the component way. Nice and easy with all these zeros. So it's multiply the x components, multiply the y components, multiply the z components and add them all up to give a single number, a scalar, not a vector. A scalar product that produces a single number divided by the two lengths. Well, that's just the Pythagoras in three dimensions. So it's going to be the negative 8 squared, the 4 squared, and the negative 1 squared. Just to put it down exactly, but the fact that it's negative makes no difference to the squaring. 0 squared, 0 squared. I know that's nothing, but it's put it down for completeness. And then, what kind of that comes to? Because it's very quick and easy. Nothing, nothing, 4. Top comes to 4. This part here, you don't need to spell it all out. <coughs> You've got 64 and 16 and 181. Here, that's just going to be, that's a pity because that's just going to be 
four squared going back to the square root back to four again. I'll write it down since I've started by putting that in. <coughs> then you can just do the inverse course on that, because normally these two don't turn out to be perfect squares, but since they are perfect squares, I'll just put it at the side here, I've actually got four over nine times four, which cancels down to a ninth, which means that angle QPA, just putting the angle sign back at the front now, is going to be the inverse cos of one ninth. So it's just a case of switching on and doing shift cos of one divided by nine, and you get the answer, 83, oh, 83.62 dot dot dot, just call that 83.6 degrees. And there you go. Question two. So, number three, <coughs> what have we got here? Some trig graphs, cosine graph, sine graph of sorts, and there you go. <coughs> Wave function question, eight marks. Is, uh, first part, <coughs> write down the value of P from the first graph, which is a cosine graph. Well, it goes up root seven and down root seven, symmetrical by the x-axis, so P, the amplitude of it, is root seven. Q, it goes up three and down three. So amplitude would be 3, apart from the fact this is upside down. So that means the amplitude is going to be negative 3 in that case. Right. Next part, 2. That was 2. B. Write f of x plus g of x. So f of x plus g of x, which were these two. So that's root 7 cos x minus 3 sine x. Now to write that in the form of k cos x plus a. No degree signs anywhere, this question's in radians. That's confirmed by this part anyway, but even without that part at the end, I suppose you've got the radians there as well, but even without that part, if there are no degree signs mentioned anywhere, then those angles are in radians. Right, so I'll have to expand that. So that's going to be k times cos x cos a minus sine x sine a. So just to emphasise cosmetically the coefficient of cos x, k cos a cos x minus k sine a a mess, sine x should be equal to the original expression. Well, equating the coefficients, whatever it says on this side must be the same as this side. That cos must be the same as that cos. So that k cos a must equal root 7, we'll call that 1, and the coefficient of sine x, the negative of this, should be the same as the negative 3. So k sine a should be 3, we'll call that number 2, a positive 3, because it's taken by 3, take away this, which must also be a 3. A pair of simultaneous equations. Now, it's not necessary to state exactly how this is worked out by setting it all out, but the way it's worked out is to eliminate the cosses and the sines, you square them and add them. I think I'll put that down. So if you take 1 squared and add on to 2 squared, you'd have k squared cos squared plus k squared sine squared. That's k squared of cos squared plus sine squared, which is 1, so that's just k squared. That's why you just get k squared equals that squared plus that squared. So I'll just put 7 plus 9 which means k is going to be the square root of that, square root of 16, so k is going to be 4. To get rid of the k's, divide the equations. So it's going to be 1 divided by 2. So 1 divided by 2, sorry, 2 divided by 1 in this case, to form a tangent. So 2 divided by 1 is going to give me sine over cos, which is the tangent of a. And that's going to be 3 upon root 7. Now we don't know what that is. It's already said that a needs to be in the first quadrant. We'll just check that. They're both positive. The sine's positive, the cosine's positive, the angle a will indeed be in the first quadrant. But this needs to be in radians. So the best thing to do there is to take your calculator and switch it into radian mode. So inverse tan, a is going to be the inverse tan of 3 upon root 7. Forgot the little so negative one there. setting the calculator into radian mode, and doing inverse tan, you get the answer 0 0.8480, etc. Which means that the final answer would be f of x plus g of x equals 4 
cos x plus 0 0.848. And that fits within the range because pi up in 2, half of pi is greater than 1.5 and, and that's only 0.8. So that would be our answer. So part C. Having copied this down from the previous part, find f dash dx plus g dash dx as a single trigonometrical function because you don't need to go back to f dash dx was the cos so that differentiates to a negative sign and g dash dx, g with x was the sign so differentiates to a cos and then go through the whole wave function business again. No. If you differentiate an expression made up of separate terms, it's equal to the sum of the derivatives. You don't have to differentiate polynomial terms anyway. If you've got x cubed plus 3x squared, to differentiate that whole thing, you just do 3x squared, no matter what happens to be there, and 6x, no matter what happens to be there, those two form the derivative. So it's the same here. If that's what this comes to, then the derivative of those will just be that. 4 is the coefficient, that will stay. Cos goes to negative sine. Inside, it's got this expression, this linear expression. The derivative of that is just 1, so it's just times 1. And, significantly, that angles and radians. Or else you wouldn't have been able to do that differentiation quite so simply. Because these constants only work, these different derivatives only worked out to be 1s when it's in radians. If that had been x degrees, You'd have had to change it. There'd have been a factor of pi upon 180, which would have come out. But you don't have to bother with that. As long as it's in radians, it's fine. You can differentiate it. Right, well, that was question three.